a Build Hatch developed production. Hello, I'm Aaron Kyle and welcome to another episode of Build Hatch. Welcome to Build Hatch's first episode of 2021. This year we're in for an absolute cracker and we have some amazing guests and exciting plans for the year ahead. I've been working hard over the summer break with my team, so stay tuned for some exciting announcements coming your way. Being the first Build Hatch episode for the year, I thought it would be fitting to get a leading architect's perspective on what the year lies ahead for architects, as these guys are often the first point of contact for a project or an inquiry. So it's great to hear their perspective on the outlook for 2021 and the year ahead. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Anthony Furness from EJE Architecture. EJE Architecture has a national practice along the east coast of Australia and Anthony is a director of the EJE practice and his team. This chat was a great one and you'll hear Anthony's background and appreciation of good old-fashioned relationships and the importance of picking up the phone or even better yet, having a conversation to resolve problems and collaborate. This week's conversation was a great one to kick the year off, so let's get into it. Anthony Fonesse from EJE Architecture, welcome to Build Hatch. Thanks for having me, Aaron. All right, so we're sitting here in your Newcastle offices and um, before we hear more about EJE and a bit about your firm, we always like to take it back to the beginning. So whereabouts did you grow up? So I grew up in the northern suburbs of Sydney, pretty bushy area, a long way from the beach. And I had probably the first 15 years there and then my dad came home one day and said, right, you're the last one at home. My two older siblings had uh, finished school and he said, I've just been offered a job in Cairns. So I quick, quickly dialed up where Cairns was and went, oh, you know, it looks all right. Far North Queensland, there's got to be some surf up there. The more I read, the more I read, no surf in Cairns. <laughs> a little bit um, flat. A little bit flat, except when the cyclones come along. But he said, this is only a two-year contract. Um, at the end of the two years, you know, you'll be finished school. You'll probably head back south anyway. Um, so I had two years up there. It was we treated it as a you know twenty four month holiday. It was you know it was a great place. Um, learned to dive, and one of the the things that struck me coming out of you know northern suburbs of Sydney was it was probably my first real interaction with an Aboriginal community, and that's probably one of the things that um, I sort of think back now at how beneficial. It was for me because I just didn't have that exposure in northern suburbs of Sydney. Um, at the time, I probably didn't appreciate it, but as I said, now that I look back on it, it was time I probably wish I had over again and, and spent a lot more time taking advantage of that level of exposure. Most of it came through sport, but a lot of it also came through school. And, you know, we do a lot of travelling with um, representative sport and, you know, staying for weekends um, with my teammates and getting to know a lot more about where they came from and their families and uh, their cultural background. So, yeah, that was that was a really good time. And then finally we did make our way back south and, again, sliding doors, put in my applications for university at the end of the year 12. One was for Sydney, one was for Newcastle, and I got a knock on the door, bedroom door from Dad saying, mate, you're off to Newcastle. And went, okay, where's that? Um, <laughs> No, I knew I knew where Newcastle was. Um, a lot it was a dirty old there. coal town back then. Yeah, I'm sure. He um he threw me in the car. He said we've got to find a place to live, and he drove me straight to Newcastle Beach. And I sort of sat there and went, "Yeah, okay, you sold me." Straight <laughs> away. So was that your first sort of option for for getting into no, university? Wasn't. It wasn't. It was it was Sydney. Was architecture your first preference? I remember having five. You had to list five, and I had architecture for the first three and occupational therapy for four and five. I think I got talking to someone about creativity in the health sciences and if you were interested in creativity, that OT could be an avenue um, where you're trying to you know, problem solve and come up with physical, tactile solutions for people. And so, yeah, that was four and five, but I think Newcastle may have been three <laughs> and I landed right in the middle in Newcastle. Well, you, um, you did better than I did because... I think I had medicine as number one as you do and all these other ones and then all the way down to I think I had construction management on number seven. <laughs> and yeah, 
So that's, <laughs> oh, I'm glad it happened, but that, yeah, that's why I did construction management. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is funny where you think you want to be versus where you end up and looking back going, yeah, I landed in the right spot. Yeah. You look back and think it happened for a reason, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think that comes along, uh, that line of thinking comes along a lot of the times when you end up in a, a an area or a position that you least expected it. it's for a reason. All right, so what was it like studying architecture at Newcastle University? Oh, it was fantastic. I think, um, again, you had people from all walks of life being in a regional town. Um, you had the locals mixed up with people who were you know, from down south or whether they were from in the country, up the coast. Um, so, you know, the atmosphere was, you know, there was a level of seriousness to it because you were at university for the first year, but there was certainly a filter of, fun around it and um, I think the two guys that I met on that very first day one of them's one of our fellow directors so we've never moved too far away from each other professionally and I think that's that goes away to explaining how Newcastle sort of operates or this area of the coast uh, operates in terms of people gen- generally not moving too far once they've got here because they can appreciate um, the benefits of living here but it was yeah it got me in straight away architecture from day one at university I sort of got into looking at architecture from probably when I was starting high school we had a renovation going on at home and you know I'd be forever going onto the site after hours and seeing what they'd done and seeing how it all goes together and then I was particularly interested in how they did it um, in terms of, well, how do you know where this wall's going? And they'd show me drawings and then I'd try and understand where those drawings have come from and then I'd probably had conversations with my dad around, well, why have you done this? And so I think the curiosity started before high school and then, you know, as I said, it, it was probably maintained all the way through to those selections of one, two and three and being in architecture. What about going through university? Did you have the opportunity to go work for different firms and gained some practical experience throughout your degree when you were studying? Yeah, at the end of third year, so the degree at that time was broken into a science degree and an architecture degree, science being the first three years, and then they promote you going off and uh, working in an office or travelling before you then come back and do your fourth and fifth year. So I took all of my fourth year, uh, worked for two firms, one large one in Sydney, and a smaller one back here in Newcastle. And, yeah, that then springboard you into fourth and fifth year, you know exactly what's going on, you know, the context around what you're learning at university and how it's applied. Um, So 100% invaluable experience going and working in a practice. How far along was it before you sort of worked out that you wanted to specialise in a particular field like commercial or residential architecture or does it not really work like that as an architect? You kind of like to do a bit of both or, or all of them? I think coming out of university, I just wanted to experience a lot. I didn't have a particular focus at that stage in any particular sector. Um, I think then as a junior, you know, find your place within a practice, you know, assisting different architects and, you know, you may express an interest, oh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at more of a residential focus and you might be lucky enough to land in a residential firm, uh, residential practice or a residential team within a larger practice but I pretty much just went with the flow I think my first as a postgraduate the first team I landed in was a it was a high school combined with a primary school so it was a decent sized job and that was a foray into education for me it was purely circumstantial I just found myself landing in teams that were either doing education work in secondary or the odd tertiary education probably for the first three or two years at least it was mainly in education but then what happened was I got an offer from one of the education clients tertiary education client to go and work within their uh, infrastructure or facilities management department for me at that time it was you know you're only two years out probably should stay and experience service delivery architecture for a bit more time but this opportunity came up from a client services perspective where you're actually writing briefs or developing briefs for other architects based on your interactions with directly with um, different client groups within the university but also take on some smaller work that they wouldn't 
push out to other architectural practices, but it gave you a, a very clear insight into the context that in which an architect operates in. In other words, you see the other side, you see what the clients are after in terms of the service that they're looking for from an architect or you're looking at the problems that they have out there or any client, for example, has before they end up in a position where they do approach an architect to provide a service. But I think the other thing was we were embedded in a group that you know had two or three other architects working in-house but you also had a whole gamut of engineers and other specialists. So you work daily with these people and you, again, it just expanded the context within which an architect operates. Um, and you can see what you know other challenges other disciplines have. Um, you're also working with buildings that are you know, 40 years old. You can see what parts of them uh, deteriorate over time, what designs last. Uh, from a practical point of view and I think when I go back to why I got into architecture in the first place if I was honest with myself it was the practicality of architecture as opposed to the high level design thinking that grabbed me in it wasn't from an artistic it was from a a practical and pragmatic direction and I think over time that um, artistic side has started to germinate through exposure to other architects that you work with over time and also other other clients. Clients play a big role in the final solution whilst the architects do develop the solution. It's really up to the client to either accept what you're putting forward, uh, whether they're willing to take a risk, but they also, some of them are extremely artistic themselves and they their ideas definitely work symbiotically with the architect in coming up with the final solution. So I think over time the artistic side came up, but I really enjoyed the practicality of working within that facilities management arena and just understanding the full life cycle of a building so that when you go back to putting your pen to paper from the outset, you've got a clear idea in your head as to where these buildings are going to end up in 40 years. Yeah, so you love the the functional aspect of the architecture and I'd imagine working with educational type clients, it's so important, isn't it? And you do have to think about the, the end user in over the next 40 years, like you said, how do they use this space? What are they using this space for? Can it be adapted or changed or multifunctional? So there's a fair bit in it, isn't there? There is 100%. Uh, when you mentioned adaptability and flexibility, that's, that's the mindset that you're working in with clients that have assets that um, they're going to manage for the next 40, 50 years is how can they churn? How do they adapt? How can you give them something that's, you know, still exciting from the outset but still has that practical underlay of, you know, we've got to move this wall in the future or we've got to um, make this room smaller or bigger, you know, we're going to change it from a general teaching space to a highly specialised world, you know, what do you need to take into account to enable that in the future? And that type of thinking has, you know, it progresses into how you approach sustainability because environmental sustainability is not purely around building materials and where they're coming from, how long they last, but it's also looking at how can you design a building that can adapt without it having to be significantly modified and therefore require additional significant number of materials in the future to enable it to adapt. How can it adapt very easily and therefore not require another project in the future? Can this building serve as a multi project solution so you you well and truly thinking long term yeah i think if you if you can particularly for those long-term clients long term by that i mean um, clients that have buildings that they're going to manage for the longer term such as your um, schools tertiary education more so than from the development side the development side has a different agenda the long-term asset clients yeah that's definitely where we we're starting to look with sustainability. It's beyond that first hit of, you know, where materials come from, what the operational energy impact is of running this particular building, but how can it adapt? Now, you're a director of EJE, so tell us about a typical day in the life of Anthony with EJE. (laughs) Is there a typical day? (laughs) It's funny, some days I get home and I just think, God, I've got to write down what I did today because it was so varied. To be honest with you, I 
don't think there's a typical day. But what I can do is tell you <laughs> what some days consist of. I didn't realise how much time I spent on the phone until COVID hit and we were working from home. And my wife over dinner said to me one day, she said, I have no idea how much you talk. No wonder when you get home, you're quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I said, i just got to give my voice a rest. But I don't think I was conscious of that too. We spend a lot of time, particularly at this level, talking. It's very much about relationships at your your level of the business. You have relationships with the clients. You have relationships with your fellow directors, plus all of the associates and other architects and staff. It's a varied role. I can I can see why it, it is. You sort of mix the role up, as you said. It's it's largely relationship driven. You mix that up with I think architecture as or I think the building industry is a collaborative industry. You know, buildings don't go up because of the architect. Buildings don't go up because of the builder. Builders go up because everyone's involved. You've got all of the trades. You've got suppliers. You've got the project managers, other design disciplines. Everyone has to work collectively at some point during that process to get the end result. So, yeah, in the director role, yes, you are talking to a lot of people around potential new work. Um, You might be problem solving on the phone with another senior management um, staff member of a building organisation or another design discipline. Um, You might be on the phone talking to a council officer about a planning proposal you've got in. You might be talking on the phone to your other staff around what's going on and what needs to happen. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of correspondence. And the other thing I learnt over the years with correspondence is picking up the phone and talking to people is probably the, the best. You always follow it up in writing to formalise it, but just getting on the phone is by far number one. And if you can meet them in person, even better. I just find that communication is a lot clearer. We can hide behind our keyboards sometimes, which is in certain situations not to the benefit of the situation, but I think face-to-face conversation is number one. Yeah, look, I, I love it and I'm a big proponent of it, of good old-fashioned relationships and and that's part of having this conversation is hearing the genuine story and all of the challenges, the good bits, the bad bits and everything in between. Now, I'm really excited making this the first episode of 2021 and the reason being is we've just gone through 2020 COVID and that's presented a heap of challenges all around the world and both personally and it's obviously impacted people's lives but I wanted to get a perspective of an architect who has in Australia at least we've managed to get through COVID at the moment we've had to adapt and change and remodel the way we do things in business and our our client interaction as you said and, and as well as our staff so what's your synopsis if you like of 2021 or or post-COVID moving into the future with we've seen a massive shift with the way people use buildings so that impacts not just the way commercial buildings are intended but also residential as well so what's what's your sort of take on that moving forward? I think moving forward knowledge is the king when it first hit none of us knew what was going on no one knew how long no one knew Uh, When I say how long, how long a lockdown might last, I think definitely over the past eight months we've got a better understanding of how long they can last, um, how short they might be, how long they might be, so you can look ahead a little bit clearer if one comes along again and we know instantly how to adapt in terms of uh, where we might be working. When it first hit, we are a collaborative industry and we are you know, very much within the office, working collectively as soon as the lockdown came and we had to all find ways of working at home. And there was a, a level of transition around that, I think, with, you know, future hard lockdowns that, you know, we can move really quickly. Um, and that fear associated with not knowing what's going to be next, I think, won't be there. I think we'll just be, yep, let's back up, we're off, and we're straight into that remote communication model and we're continuing delivery. I get the sense that our clients are the same. You know, we had some sectors that our practice delivers to that pretty much just stopped. They rang up that project, stop, don't do any work on it. I think that they have a sense of, well, I know how to adapt, I know what's coming, and potentially take advantage of some of those hard lockdowns 
to do additional work that they may not have otherwise been able to do because their premises are vacant, for example, and getting in there and doing some um, construction work and then knowing that they'll come out the other side and they'll, you know, have a finished product that people will be able to get straight into. I'm hoping that sentiment of knowing what's ahead of a lockdown carries through to not being fearful of the future and just wanting to get on with things so that the river of industry continues to flow. I think construction has been extremely lucky, particularly in um, New South Wales, in that it's been an industry that's been able to be maintained and continue with sites being able to stay open. I think out of all the construction sites we were involved with, I think only one in Sydney was impacted by a positive test. But again, that didn't impact progress on those sites. So because those sites are open, we're able to keep some of those projects going within the office. So I, you know, I'm, I'm really positive. I think also with not knowing, some clients with their budget forecasts were very conservative, rightly so. But now that they're coming out of some of those budget forecasts, they're being a little bit less conservative with. So there is a little bit more expenditure in the market than there, there was when we first got that first hard lockdown. So I think that the overall confidence is a lot better and I think our ability to adapt is a lot better and they go hand in hand. What about the design aspect of the impacts with people shifting to maybe work from home a couple of days a week? I mean, my, my personal opinion on people working from home is I don't think it will be you either do or you don't. I think it'll be a mixture. You know, there'll be some people that still enjoy the interaction and want to get back to the office. They, they may live a little bit further away from the city at the end of the day, but they still want to work in the office and have that engagement and that interaction. So have you seen a shift in the way buildings or the way clients are coming to you and saying, look, like, is there a new model as such? I thought they might have been. I don't think there is. I well, for the last, I don't know, 10 years, call it, we've always had a phone we can do FaceTime so we could almost work remotely anyway it's just kind of pushed that trend a little bit in the other direction a bit more I think that's it I think people's hesitation to work remotely we were forced into it at one point and when we found what areas of it works what area of it doesn't work as efficiently we're just using it where it works for example remote meetings it was always felt that no got to get there in person and you were organizing your daily schedule around travel um how i can't do that meeting back to back because i've got to get there and i remember during covid i think i had four meetings back to back that there's no way i would have been able to get to two of them i was able to get to face to face but then in between those two i was able to just jump out find a room bang i'm straight into the next meeting that was in sydney and the other two were in newcastle and then jump on another one at the end of the day down to Melbourne without any hesitation of anyone saying, ah, oh, what, you can't make it in person. Oh, see what you can do. It was, yep, this is it. And I think to me that's the change that's probably most apparent is people's acceptance of if you can't get there in person, um, it's not the end of the world and we, we can move on and, and it'll be okay. In, with respect to working remotely as opposed to whether you're in the office 100%, we're all humans, we're all different. We all have different feelings about working on our own versus working collectively within the office. Again, it's it's given us the flexibility to, with some staff, if they've got certain things that they need to be at home for, that when they say, I'm going to be working from home today, is that okay? You don't have any hesitation in, oh, you know, are you sure you're going to be working from home? Are you going to be distracted <laughs> by you know, what's happening at home? Because... It could have gone pear-shaped. You know, when, when the lockdown happened and everyone was off working remotely, you know, your delivery may have been affected significantly um, within, it, within our industry. I like how you said acceptance, and, and I think you're spot on there. We've accepted that the work will still get done. We're not measuring things as such, although some businesses obviously do, but we've just accepted it. That we're not second-guessing can you or can't you work as well at home or does this impact our productivity or our bottom line it's more about okay we know the work will get done and we're confident in our systems we've now as a as a group or, or your you guys have an, a national office with EJE so you've accepted that 
you know, you can kind of tap into those resources and I- accept that the work will get done. And I think there's acknowledgement from the staff that they appreciate that level of flexibility now. To be honest, in, in my experience, the productivity has, has gone up as opposed to going down. I know others have had a different experience, but you know, certainly mine has been that there's no negative in what we're putting out, which is a credit to the, to the staff as well. But I think it comes with that trust and understanding that work's not the be-all and end-all um, and certain things happen that need you to be at home particularly family and and I think staff appreciate that and they do more than make up for it. That's what I've learned out of working remotely as a result of lockdowns. Now, who inspires you, Anthony, both sort of professionally and, and personally? I suppose my father's way about going about business has been influential. So I'll use the word influential for now. He was someone that always, before he retired, just got on with it, didn't make fanfare about it and then you'd, wouldn't hear too much about it at home and then you'd hear from his colleagues about how he just went about getting things done. That was priority and then you'd sort of drive past some of the things that he was involved with. He was a project manager, civil engineer by trade and you'd sort of go, oh, yeah, that's impressive. But it was how he also interacted with other people. He, you know, never thought himself... As much as he led projects, he never saw himself above the others. It was always a collective. And mind you, we never had these conversations. I never asked him about his approach. It was just what I'd witnessed and what I'd heard from other people that he worked with. Because then when I got into the construction industry, I'd come across people and say, oh, yeah, I used to work with your dad. And then they'd tell me stories, which were consistent, mind you, with how I perceived the way he went about things. And, yeah, it's certainly a way that, I try and model myself around, you know, get the job done, you see what needs to be done, everyone's on the same level, you know, you might have this title against you but by no means can you do it without all these other people and just get on with it. I couldn't agree more and that comes down to those uh, those true leadership qualities that you talked about with your father and no one's taught those qualities, you know, you they sort of develop over time and, and I think particularly – coming from a practical background myself in the construction industry, architects can be inherently artistic and for someone to step up and go through time and become a director of a large architectural practice, managing those types of people, that comes down to good leadership skills to be able to do that. So to be a director of a large practice like you are, you can kind of make the link and see where it's evolved over time and, and come from with the influence of your of your dad like you said now i'm really excited to be asking you this question if you're a builder and or you're a chippy and you've just gone out on your own and and you wanted to start your own construction business what's the best way to get in with incredible architects like yourself not being a builder myself and not being in that position if i if i look back on how my career has grown and so within the practice i was lucky enough to be given an opportunity opportunity by you know different directors to go down a path of chasing work in a particular area I started small I started small because I was confident I could manage small I started small because I thought the client's risk in taking me on was small and couple those two together opportunities arose and when you got those opportunities you loved the opportunity what I mean by that is you love the job therefore you put in you know, all your efforts to making that job, no, how, no matter how small it was, the best job you could make it. And then you just keep doing that. And then gradually you build up a capability and therefore a confidence in other clients to take you on on larger projects. And it's got to be patient, but it grows. As long as you keep that mentality of making it the best job it is, no matter what, that those opportunities will get bigger. That's what I'd probably recommend to someone starting out. And it's it's not so much sending an email or picking up the phone. It's more about lining up a meeting, knocking on the door, dropping off some information. Yeah. Like that good old-fashioned type of marketing still works, doesn't it? And including having a coffee. When you think about how many emails you get in a day, it's very easy for someone to hit delete, especially if they're pulling through a batch of 25, 30 emails. 100% face-to-face next best thing's a phone call we've had current employees 
have taken up positions in the office purely because they knocked on the door. Face to face opportunities, uh, you know, probably the ones you would chase, hundred percent. And they're sometimes hard to get, and you've got to take your chances. And timing's everything. Again, I look back at some of the projects we've been involved with, or positions I've taken up, have all been around timing. Never take an opportunity for granted. Never miss an opportunity where you can. And don't be afraid to pick up the phone. There'll be countless people who say, listen, can you just take a message? And some of them won't get back to you. Don't be put off by that because it only takes one or two of those people to ring you back or open the door or accept an invitation for coffee. That's all you need, one or two, and then things can germinate from there. Look, I I was reading a book over Christmas and a statistic that I was really impressed with and, and I was quite understanding of it is that it takes on average... 12 forms of contact or communication with with a client or a potential opportunity or any form of transaction more to do with with business so if i'm a a builder and i'm reaching out to you and i send an email or pick up the phone or come into the office we might even have one meeting then i need to have a second follow-up meeting then i might have to come back and talk to your panel to be able to be accepted on the EJE tender list. Then it might be a text message, a couple of missed calls. On average, there's 12 forms of communication before that transaction develops into getting it across the line and that transaction actually occurring. So whilst it sounds like a a big number, if you think about it, it really makes sense. Yeah, and it does. And it's funny you mentioned that um, average of 12. When you actually land that job, I think it's really important to impress on the people working on that job the effort that it took to get it and that don't take it for granted. It just doesn't land on your lap. Projects in our industry in particular are competitive and when you get it, don't ever take it for granted and take that mentality all the way through to when you hand it over because I think that also ends up being the best form of marketing is handing over a really good job and garnishing the trust in your clients to either have another conversation with another potential client about how positive they were about that project you delivered for them or even the next project they might have. So I think it does start from that effort at the beginning and acknowledging that effort all the way through the project. Yeah, look, I, I always say that it's it's an opportunity that leads to another opportunity. So you may not make a lot of money on that first second maybe even third job but every single one of those opportunities leads to another opportunity and and if you just keep applying the those qualities that you talked about which is you know one of the big ones that stood out then was was trust it goes a long way and along with that trust and you know, loving the job that you have into when i say job i mean the project you know that love then leads to the effort that you put in and the clients can see that and then also that lands in the in the is reflected in the result but that also carries through to acknowledging who the client is and making their job particularly in commercial projects making their job easier so when they come to you with a project they've obviously got a job to do and if you can make their job easier they'll keep coming back to you because they know that their job will be made easier if they work alongside you and that carries through to young kids working in fast food outlets where there's a job there's always a job no one likes to do you know, might be cleaning the dining room, but if your manager is constantly putting um, staff out there and they're not doing a good job, it's not the most glamorous job, you know, those kids are less likely to get shifts back from that manager. If you're a kid that goes in there, cleans that dining room the best you can and doesn't complain about being put in that position to do it, that manager will ring you up and give you another shift and that'll keep going and keep going. So if you take that mentality as an adolescent, making your manager or making your client's job easy, I think, and my experience has been that it does end up in repeat business. What does Anthony like to do outside of work when you're not busy being a director of EJE? Um, Immersing myself in salt water. I think I mentioned at the start that I grew up a long way from the beach, so I appreciated it when I got wheels and was able to get there whenever I could, and then especially moving to Newcastle, you're never too far away from the beach. Um, And I'm never too far away from the beach. It's my um, council you know, if you can find your your own space out there away from everyone else and you can just sort of clear your mind and it keeps you physically fit as well as mentally fit. You know, there's a 
bit of creativity in it. And it was Tim Winton that said it's dancing on water. It's the only time men ever look good dancing. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's my number one passion. And the fact that I can do it with different members of my family just make it all the more better. Yeah, Newcastle certainly has some of the, the best beaches in the world, that's for sure. So EJE, you guys have a, a national office, so Sydney, Newcastle and the Gold Coast. If people listening to this want to reach out or get into contact with you, what's the best way to go about it? Uh, probably ring our head office and then through the usual channels of email or through some of our social pages such as Instagram, direct messaging. But I, going back to some of the things I spoke about, getting on the phone and making a phone call and there'll certainly be someone here that will take your call. Yeah, look, I, I love it. And as I said before, massive fan of good old-fashioned networking and the power of just having a genuine conversation. Anthony, it's been great having you. So, Anthony from EJE, thank you for coming on to Build Hatch and sharing your story. And um, I look forward to keeping in touch and uh, watching your firm well into the future. Thanks for having me. Well, that was another Build Hatch episode with Anthony Furness from EJE Architects. What a great story. And these guys are doing a great job in the education space and even did an amazing job of designing a good friend of mine's recent project and a former guest on our show, Lisa McGuigan from VAMP in the Hunter Valley. Well, as I said earlier, we are now into the new year and stay tuned for the amazing lineup of guests coming your way. As usual, please check out our Instagram and other socials where you'll be able to learn more about our guests and the features of the work that we talk about. Have a great week and you'll hear me again on the airwaves next week. Thanks for listening to another episode of Build Hatch. You have experienced a Build Hatch developed production.